So I just kind of want to start out first kind of recapping where we've been for the last probably month because to catch you up on where we were, what's been going on uh, up to this time. And if you remember, Paul had gone back after doing his uh, missionary journey. He'd come back. He had received offerings from the churches throughout Turkey, what's today Turkey, and, and Greece, and Macedonia, and all the churches. And he was bringing back an offering uh, to take to the churches in Jerusalem, to the church in Jerusalem. And so he comes back, and he's also has gone into the temple uh, to worship. And he paid for a couple of other guys who were going through purification rites to go into the temple. And it says there were several Jews from, uh, from Asia who were there. And again, Asia at that time was Turkey. And began to accuse him of one thing was telling the Jews that they don't need to follow Moses anymore to break all their customs. And the other was that he had brought into the temple a uh, Gentile. Well, that was a death sentence if you, were, if you were to do that. None of these charges were true, but as they began to stir up a mob and, and accuse him of this, then they ended up taking him out of the temple and, and a mob grows and they end up closing the temple gates and they, they take him out and they're basically beating him, hit their plans, basically is, is to kill him. And the Roman commander, who happens to be right next to the temple, was where the, the barracks were for the Roman army. And the commander, it was, it, it was easy to tell, riots going on. And so he rushes down there, takes a lot of soldiers, takes, goes down there, and basically he rescues, he rescues uh, Paul. And, and he's trying to figure out what's going on or what's the cause of this. And so he takes him and was going to take him back to the barracks. And as he's taking him back uh, to safety in the barracks, as Paul gets to the top steps of the stairs leading up to the barracks, uh, he asks the commander if he could speak to the crowd. And he speaks uh, to Greek, in Greek to the commander, and the commander uh, says, yeah, I'll let you speak to the crowd. And so he begins to speak to the crowd in Hebrew, and he begins basically just to give his testimony. Okay, this is where, you know, and in a way kind of relating to all those, because he said, hey, I was just like you guys. I, I used to persecute Christians, you know, and now I'm here uh, to give you my testimony, what happened to me. And as he and they're listening as he does this until he gets to the point where he says about the Lord telling him he's going to send him away to the Gentiles, and that just sets them off. And they, again, are just throwing things and going wild, and so the commander has to bring him into the, uh, to the barracks area. So the commander, then uh, not knowing what's going on or what the charges are, uh, was going to flog Paul. So they tie him up to to uh, get ready to flog him. And then Paul looks over to the centurion and says, hey, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been uh, tried and, and accused of a crime? And so immediately he backs off and he goes, tells the commander, hey, no, this guy's a Roman citizen. You can't do that to a Roman citizen. So uh, the commander comes and asks him some more questions. And and then the, the Jews, the Sanhedrin, wants him to come back because they want to question him. And so the commander brings him back the next day. And during that time, uh, Paul knows, of course, that half the uh, Sanhedrin is uh, Pharisees and half is Sadducees. And again, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Sadducees don't believe that. So... He says, well, I'm on trial today for the resurrection of the dead. So that causes a big a turmoil between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And so they start arguing, and it almost starts to be a, a riot again. So the commander has to bring him back into the barracks to protect him. And at this point, um, the Jews make a plan to tell 
the commander to bring Paul back. They want to question him again, but actually it's just a, a ruse to allow them to ambush him because they've got 40 guys who have made a, uh, a vow not to eat, not to drink until they have killed Paul. And so their plan was as he was on the way to Sanhedrin, they would ambush him and kill him there. But Paul's nephew finds out about it, and he tells Paul, and Paul lets him go tell the commander, and so the commander knows about this plan. So at night, he sends Paul to Caesarea, and Caesarea is, a, is the, uh, that's the seat of power for the Roman Empire in Judea. And he sends him to Felix, who's the governor of, of Judea. So he sends him there, and he appears before Felix, and he's given, again, an opportunity to give his testimony and to tell uh, what happened in his life and, and refute the, uh, the charges because the, the uh, chief priest and a, basically a, a, pers- a prosecutor came with him to make the charges. So after all that, uh, Felix realizes there's really no crime that's been committed here. So, but he says, it says they wishing to do the Jews a favor, he keeps Paul in custody for two years. So, as we come up to chapter 26, what has happened is um, Felix, who was a, a really not a good administrator, was replaced by the Romans with a man named Festus, okay? Now, that's not Marshall Dillon's sidekick. This is a different Festus, okay? And so Festus uh, is, is brought in basically to clean up the mess that Felix left. And so he immediately begins to take up on and find out about Paul's case and to deal with that. And so that kind of brings us up to, to where we are at as we get ready for 26. Uh, I do want to read... Because actually from verse 23 of chapter 25, uh, it's really uh, part of the same story. So I want to kind of start there. So in verse 23, it says, The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officials and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Okay, so so we get to know the players here. So you have Festus, who is a gov- the governor, Roman governor. You have Agrippa. This is actually Agrippa the uh, second. His father was Agrippa the first, who is the one who killed uh, James the apostle, and then later was eaten by worms. And he, and so his grandfather of Agrippa II is Herod the Great. Now, this Bernice, if you're just reading through there, you may think, well, Bernice is, is his wife. Well, no, it's actually not his wife. It's actually his sister. And so I want to kind of read to you what the Bible dictionary says about Bernice. And it says, according to Josephus, she was the el- eldest daughter of Herod Agrippa I. She was a very wicked woman who lived an incestuous life. She was first married to Marcus, and after his death, she became the wife of Herod of Chalice, who was her own uncle. After Herod's death, she had an evil relationship with Agrippa II, her own brother. She later married Potney of Sicily, and this marriage was short, and she returned to Agrippa. She later was married to Vespasian and Titus, not married. She was a mistress to Vespasian and Titus, who finally cast her away. So she makes Jezebel look like a saint, basically. Now, uh, Vespasian was a... He was a Roman general, that, which is going to unfold later in history. But he's a, the Roman general who's in charge of all the uh, 
Roman legions who were coming in to Judea because what had happened was that the Judeans, the Jews, rebelled against Rome and they started a war. So it's called the Judean War. And so he was in charge of taking back the country for Rome. And he was in the process of doing that when uh, Rome decided to call him back and make him the emperor. So he makes, makes him an emperor, and then Titus is his son. So his son takes over the Roman legions, and he's the one who actually, in 70 AD, goes in and captures Jerusalem, destroys the temple, over a million Jews were killed, and fulfilled uh, the prophecy of Jesus where he said, you see this temple? Not one stone will be left upon another. So he was actually the, German gen or the Roman gen or general who came in and actually fulfilled that word. So she had an affair with both of them and was also, again, involved in incest with his brother. So you have to kind of realize that as we get to this place of what's going to be happening in, in verse 20 or chapter 26. So I'm going to continue on with <clears throat> back in, in 25, verse 24. So Festus says, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man? The whole Jewish community had petitioned me about him in Jerusalem. And here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definitely to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this invitation, investigation, I might have something to write, for I think it unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. So Felix is really using some wisdom here because he knows um, Agrippa and Bernice both are Jews. They're, you know, Agrippa's a, the, the uh, Jewish king, and he'd be familiar with all the you know, controversies going on within Judaism. And so he wants him there so that when Paul comes, hopefully he'll get some information so that when he sends him to Rome, he's got something to, to charge him with and, and, and be able to give Caesar. So it's kind of like a, a Supreme Court. It's like if we were here and you appealed a case, eventually you could appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, in this way, Paul could eventually uh, appeal to Caesar himself, because the Roman citizen had that right. All right, so let's go to the first three verses. So you know all the players here. So then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul mentioned with, motioned with his hands and began his defense. King Agrippa I consider myself fortunately to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So again, King Agrippa was very familiar with the uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes, also even with Christianity. So he knew all the different factions within Judaism. And again, that's one reason that, that Festus brought him in, so he'd be able to give him more information. Okay, verse 4 through 8. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. 
And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? So Paul making the point about the resurrection of Jesus, that he is fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures, that he is the one, uh, that he is the Messiah that they're all waiting on. He didn't come in the way they expected, but he is the answer. He is the Messiah. And so it's about the resurrection. Okay, let's look at 9 through 11. And Paul says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem on the authority of the chief priest. I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities. It's interesting that it says, in my obsession for them. So it's not like a normal reaction. I mean, he has an obsession. And the ESV says that he was with raging fury against the Christians. So even so, there's a spiritual component of that that is not just a normal response that he was obsessed with attacking Christians and, and, and doing everything he could, whether it was arresting them, killing them, uh, shutting down the whole movement. Now, this interesting thing is He says, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So that that brings up a a bit of a controversy or or different opinions with different scholars, because some will say that, uh, that this shows that Paul was a member, well, when he was Saul, okay, his other life, he was a member of the Sanhedrin because they would cast votes to decide this person's going to die, this person will get in prison. And so they would, they, part of the scholars say they think he was a member of the Sanhedrin at that time. But to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you have to be married. And there's no, uh, nothing in the Word of God, at least, that we have that Paul or Saul was married. But their point was that he could have been married and his wife died, or perhaps uh, once he became a Christian, that she left him. So there's two different points of view, uh, and we can't say for sure 100% on either side. But that is a possibility that he had been a member of the Sanhedrin. The other thing would be when it says, I cast my vote, I could even see it being something like, you know, when Stephen is being martyred, it says that, Paul, that Saul was there and he was watching over the cloaks of those who were stoning him, okay? So that's not an official vote, but obviously he was for it. All right, let's take verses 12 through 14. He says, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. 
We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, one difference I saw that in the ESV, it says that the voice spoke to him in Hebrew. Hebrew and Aramaic are, are sister languages, some, some uh, similarities there. But what, what are the goads? Okay, kick against the goads. What, what is that? Well, a goad was a eight-foot-long wooden pole. Okay, so on one end, it had a spade. And the spade was used to clear the plow. So in other words, in those days, it wasn't like, you know, Junior does sitting in an air-conditioned cabin with a GPS and all that. You know, you're behind an oxen, and so you had a, a, a spade that was eight foot long, so it was long enough that you could clear the plow between you and the oxen. The other side had a very sharp point. So you would stick the oxen if he's, you know, halting, he's not moving fast enough, whatever. That was what you would use to get the oxen to move and to do what you wanted them to do. So when it talks about, so that's the picture you have when you say to kick against the gold, it, it pictures you know, kicking uh, a picture of useless resistance to a greater power. So he uses that term. It's interesting because in any of the other where he repeats his testimony, this is the first time that he uses that statement. And the Amplified Bible says, it is dangerous and will turn out badly for you to keep kicking against the goads. In other words, to offer vain and perilous resistance. So it does kind of make you wonder, Did had the Lord already been trying to work in Paul's life in some way? Because he doesn't tell him this until he appears to him, blinds him. So at what point was he kicking against the goads? Was it something that happened when, like when Stephen was martyred and, and he saw Stephen's face shine like an angel and, and or Stephen said, I see the, the son on the right hand of the father and he forgave those who were stoning him. We don't know. But that's what kicking against the gold is and that's what a, a gold was used for. It was a tool that a, a farmer would have with him. All right, let's look at verses 15 through 17. Then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you away to them. Now, I was thinking when I was reading that, that, he would rescue you from your own people, in other words, the Jews, and also from the Gentiles. So if you're wondering, okay, does that mean I heard that? So I guess this is going to be a pretty easy ride. You know, I'm thinking about going on the conference circuit, having my own YouTube channel, So Paul, was he thinking of that thing? Because it was not. He rescued him from death from both the Gentiles and the Jews until the time of his martyr, but his life was anything but easy. 
So I want us to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to look at verse, no, actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And verses 23 through 29. And this is where Paul is defending his apostleship. And he starts out saying, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked and spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, dangers from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, and in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin? And I do not inwardly burn. So his life was anything but easy. In fact, in one of the other earlier in uh, Acts chapter 9, when he recounts the same story, uh, the Lord talks uh, speaks to Ananias, who was going to be the one who's going to pray for him. And he says, uh, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So it was not going to be an easy life. It was going to be a very hard, a very suffering life. All right, verse 18, take by itself. He says, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So there's a question comes up, and there's, a, again, a, some argument within the Christian community. Who has blinded the eyes? Now, if you go to second, back to 2 Corinthians again, except this time 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and it says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they can see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So in that passage, it is a God of this age, which we would normally associate with Satan, the God of this world. But there's also a case that can be made that it was God who blinded them. So I'm going to give you one out of the Old Testament, one out of the New Testament, but in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, and this 
But it said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceive. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And one out of the New Testament, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. So this is Paul, and he says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant, talking about the Jewish people, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were grace, it would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened. Give them a spirit of stupor eyes so they could not see, and ears so they could not hear to this very day. So there are some who are saying, especially probably, as you can guess, coming from more of a predestination viewpoint, would say that it actually was God that blinded their eyes, while the other side of Armenian viewpoint would be, no, that it was Satan who blinded their eyes. But I just want you to know there, there are two different interpretations of how they would interpret that verse. All right, verse 19 and 20. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and to all of Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God, prove their repentance by their deeds." Now, he has a, a, a big audience right there, official military leaders, different people there, but this is specifically directed at Agrippa and Bernice. And he says, repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And remember, this is the lifestyle they're living. They're in an incestual lifestyle. I think today <clears throat> we probably need to see more of that <clears throat> because, you know, sometimes we have the big crusades and, and a lot of people come forward and they, they say the prayer of accepting Jesus in their hearts. But was there ever real repentance was there ever uh, the performing and turning of deeds of righteousness? In other words, did their life ever change? Or did they just come up, say a prayer, and then pretty much their life just went on like it was before? And I think we mislead a lot of people in not them realizing that if you are giving your life to the Lord, there should be fruit, corresponding fruit. There should be a difference in your life from what it was before to what you are now. That you are truly a new creation in Christ Jesus. But I think sometimes maybe we have given even false hope. And just saying, yeah, okay, now you're in, you're good for the rest of your life. And yet there's no development, there's no spiritual growth, <clears throat> there's no fruit in their life that can be measured. Twenty one through twenty three. 
This is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to the small and the great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. <clears throat> so Paul is always looking for an opportunity to share the gospel, to present it, also to, to bring conviction if it needs to be brought, and to share his testimony. And it's interesting that later on Paul talks about, you know, I am the most chief sinner because of his persecution of Christians, of putting them to death. So he says, hey, if I can change, you can change. But he always took the opportunities to share. So here he is, Caesarea, the seat of government power over Judea, and he has an opportunity to continue to share, just like he did earlier with uh, Felix and Drusilla. So now he's before Agrippa, before Festus, before the leaders, and he gives his testimony. And I think that's an example from, uh, for us to always, always be willing and be looking for opportunities to give our testimony, to have the Lord lead us into open, you know, an open door into someone's heart, how to share something, to not miss any opportunities. All right, we'll take the last passage all together here, starting in verse 24. It says, at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king, again talking about Agrippa, is familiar with all these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a, cor in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. So again, Paul is speaking specifically to Agrippa and Bernice. You know the prophet. You know the, the prophetic words that have been spoken. And then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or a long time, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. So obviously Paul is still in chains. Verse 30, the king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So they know that Paul is innocent. There's no real charges against him. And if he had not appealed to Caesar, but that was part of God's plans to get him to Rome, because he's going to be going to Rome and actually have the opportunity to speak to the very top officials in the Roman government. Unfortunately, for Festus, for Agrippa, for Bernice, they missed their opportunity. And if you go back to Felix and Drusilla, when he brought his testimony and confronted them, 
they were troubled. You know, they were, they were, they were uh, convicted, but they never changed. And the same thing now with, with Festus, Agrippa, Bernice. He gave his testimony. He told them the way, but they missed their opportunity to repent. So there's no record of them ever turning to the Lord. But Paul was faithful in doing what he was called to do. Just as we have to be faithful to what God's called us to do, we're leaving the results to the Lord. We can't save anyone. All we can do is be obedient to share whatever it is that the Lord puts on our hearts. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can open those, those hearts. So we have this story, ongoing story of, of Paul. He's suffering a lot, but he's also placed in positions to the very leaders of the nations. Of the nation, in this case, of Judah, both Roman and the Jewish king. Later, he's going to be going to Rome, and he's going to have that same opportunity. So the word is going forth. The testimony is being given. But it's up to the people. It's up to those who are receiving it what to do with it. And sometimes it's just rejected. And so sometimes as we share, we have to realize that, hey, not everyone is going to accept what we see. We are going to face rejection at times. But again, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord. And you never know when you're just sowing a seed, someone else is coming in later is going to water that and is going to produce fruit. So we do what we are called to do, but we don't take the pressure upon ourselves that I've got to make something happen. We have to depend upon the Lord and what he's doing. So again, we see through this, through all, you know, just through the story of Paul's life, the hardships that he went through. It, wasn't, it was not an easy life. It was a hard life, but he was faithful. You know, to me, I'd be thinking, you know, when he listed all those different things, the shipwrecks, the flogging, all, I'd be going, Lord, couldn't we make this a little easier? I mean, why does it have to be so hard? And so sometimes we kind of think of our certain situations when we think, oh, couldn't it be easier? Couldn't you make this a little? Look at Paul, the apostles of the apostles, and what he had to go through, and it was not always easy. It was not the way we would necessarily prefer. But again, the Lord is faithful, and he was putting him in positions of authority where he's speaking to the authorities of the nations. The word is going out. It's either going to be rejected or it's going to be received. But he did his part of getting the word, his testimony out. And again, so many times he uses his testimony, especially for the Jews, because it's like he's saying, hey, I, I was like you guys. I used to hate Christian. I used to be obsessed with Christian. But the Lord opened my eyes. He closed him first, then he opened my eyes. But he saw, and he totally changed his life from Saul to Paul. So be encouraged. Sometimes life throws curves at us. Sometimes we wonder, Lord, where are you? Why does it have to be so hard? Could you make this a little easier? But it says the Lord will not test you beyond your ability to stand. So we take faith in the Lord that whatever he allows, he is allowing. But we have our confidence and faith in him that he will be faithful. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Paul. How he remained faithful. Even though there are times where, he, Lord, he didn't understand. There are times when he says he was perplexed. In other words, I don't know what you're doing, Lord. I don't know why you're doing it this way. And so, Lord, sometimes we don't understand. 
And we don't understand sometimes when it's when the way it seems harder than it needs to be. But Lord, you are faithful. You are faithful, Lord. Though every man be a liar, you are faithful. And Lord, we just say we trust you, Lord. Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, we know that your ways are not our ways, and your ways are much higher than our ways. So, Lord, we thank you that you love us, that you care for us, that you have us in your hands, and that we have, again, eternity to spend with you. So, Lord, help us not to be short-sighted, but, Lord, to see the long game, to see what you're doing not just in our lives, but throughout eternity, Lord. Lord, we love you. We worship you this morning, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. All right, if anyone would like prayer, or if anyone has something else to share, feel feel free to come up, and we can pray for you. And have a great day. And stay faithful to the Lord. Amen.